peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Thank you for joining me today for Bible Study Online. Today we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, I hope you'll go ahead and turn to Exodus 3. And if you don't have your Bibles beside you, I hope that you'll go find your Bible so that you can open it up. I think it's important for us to always use our Bibles as we read Scripture. We can look at it on the screen, but it's, it's helpful for us to see it in context and to know that we can turn to our Bibles anytime to listen for God's Word being spoken to us. So today, I hope that you will hear God's Word being spoken to you today through the story that may be familiar to so many of you, the calling of Moses to deliver God's people from the suffering and oppression and slavery they're experiencing in Egypt. So the guiding questions that I want us to look at today is first, how have you experienced God's call in your own life? As we hear the call of Moses, I hope that it will call us to remember that God calls us too. That we can maybe hear the voice of God speaking to us in interesting, maybe strange ways, if we just open ourselves up to be curious about what God is doing in the world. It happens in our everyday ordinary lives. It uses some of our own gifts and passions and, and in all things as we think about Moses. I want us to not just see this as a story that happened many, many years ago, but a story about a God that continues to call us. And one of the questions we'll kind of talk about today is how do we participate with God in the mission to free the oppressed? When Jesus came to his hometown, he opened up the scriptures and he read from the place in the scroll where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's called me to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the captives free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, recognized that God's calling was one of freeing the oppressed, of bringing equity and justice to the world in which he lived. And our calling today is to participate in that same mission, to bring equity and justice, love and grace to those who are oppressed and hurting, those who need freedom and their voices heard. Last week, we talked a little bit about calling, and we recognized the questions that, that dictate our calling. God has given each of us a gift and a talent. What have others said that we do well? What do you think you do well? Maybe take a moment again this week or look back at last week's notes you made and think about what your gifts are that God has given to you. Write those down in your journal. And about what are you passionate Sometimes we just go across the status quo doing what we do every day, but I think there are those things in each of our lives that when we participate in them, when we're with children or senior adults, or I don't know what else, <laughs> but what are you passionate about? When you're with them, when you're doing this thing, it's so life-giving that you forget all sense of time. But those are not enough because those center ourselves around our gifts and about what we're passionate. We then need to center other people, to move ourselves out of the way, to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought, but to ask ourselves, what does the world need? How can I make a difference in this world? And so when we hear the story of Moses today, I hope you'll keep this, this concept of calling before you. So let's look at the text a little bit. Things are not good for the people of God back in Egypt. So if you remember the story, a baby was drawn up out of the waters. And there was a plan maybe that even felt like it was being put in place that Moses would be the one who would make a difference. But Moses ends up having to escape Egypt because he kills one of the taskmasters who is oppressing one of the Hebrew slaves. And when, he, when Moses finds out that others know about this, he fears for his life and he leaves. He makes his way to Midian. 
And here, there's this powerful tradition. He's just sitting around minding his sheep. He perhaps, you know, is doing his father-in-law's business. He's obviously settling down and married at this point. And he begins to take the flock beyond the wilderness, way, way out toward the mountain of God. He came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Horeb is also known as Sinai. That's what we remember it as most often. But he is far away from home. He is at the mountain of God. And he is able at that point to be away from his ordinary life for a moment so that he can hear the voice of God speaking to him. So there's an angel of the Lord that appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked. I think that's important too. He looked. And the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. The curiosity of Moses in seeing this miracle moves him to turn toward this bush. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, Moses had stopped what he had done to look at this sight. God calls out of him, calls to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses. I, I wonder if God had been calling out to Moses many other times in some more ordinary ways. And instead, Moses had just passed those by. So God kicks it up a little bit and and the angel burns this bush that is not consumed. And Moses finally turns aside and hears the voice of God calling. He's not distracted by all the other things that call for his attention, but his curiosity moves him toward God. And Moses says, here I am, which should be our only response to God. Here I am. It's a response of surrender. It's a response that moves us toward being able to listen. It's about being present in the moment, mindful. Here I am right now, listening. And then God says, come no closer. This voice of God stops him where he is in his tracks and says, remove your sandals. From this, for this place on which you are standing is holy ground. So I've always been intrigued by that question of why, you, why, why God wanted Moses to remove his sandals. And I don't know the answer to that, but I think someone once said that when we speak of transcendence, it's so difficult that we can't rely on our own words about what we're experiencing. All we can do is use our limited inadequate words and experiences. And so removing our sandals becomes an act that reminds us of God's holiness, that reminds us what's happening in this moment is something special. It connects us to the ground on which we walk, into the place in which we find ourselves. It grounds us with nothing between us and the creation. So as we stand before the Creator, we stand vulnerable. Here I am, Lord. And God says further to him, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So God, God is both frightening and semi-unapproachable here. So as Moses keeps his distance, takes off his shoes, he recognizes that he is on holy ground far beyond the wilderness, far away from home, but someplace where God could get his attention and God could talk to him. So I think there's some hospitality here as well. You know, when I think of taking off my shoes on sacred ground, that's a familiar idea to me, but so is the concept of kicking off our shoes getting comfortable. So I think when we invite someone into a space, we're offering hospitality and we may say, kick off your shoes and relax for a minute. 
So I think both of these things are happening here. Kicking off his shoes, taking off his shoes, invites him to be at home in this place, while at the same time claiming profound respect. Moses has been an immigrant living in a land that was not his. And now he finds himself a guest of God in this place. So this is a story of calling. And I want, as you hear some of these phrases, I want you as we move forward to think about the words that you hear that are verbs that God does. For example, observed. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, the promised land. So the cry, so, so there are lots of words here, observed, heard, know, come down, deliver. These words are about God reaching out to those who are most oppressed and lifting them up. God hears, sees us. God hears us. God seeks to deliver us from all that holds us captive. In verse 9, the cry of the Israel out lights God says has now come to me it's interesting that the Israelites and their cry out in prayer to God is what moves God to action God hears them and then sees how the Egyptians have oppressed them so come God says I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people the Israelites out of Egypt so there's a little turn here that I find fascinating God hears us God seeks to deliver us. God loves us beyond belief. Our cries go out to God, and God wants to act on them to free us from all from oppression. And then God says, now you go do that. That's our calling. Moses is called to be the, the agent of God's freeing work, God's salvation history of God's people. Moses becomes the agent of that. Moses is the hands and feet of God. So are we. So when we hear this, we say, yes, God delivers these people. God is the one who is with all of us to, to live and work and make a difference in the lives of those who are struggling. But sometimes we just relegate that to God when God actually says, so you make a difference. You go deliver them in my name. Or as we heard a few weeks ago with the feeding, when the disciples said, I, we don't have anything to feed them. We don't have anything, but God says, but Jesus says, you go feed them. And the miracle happens when they're faithful. But it's interesting because in verse 11, Moses kind of pushes back on God a little bit. And we'll see that Moses has an interesting relationship of, of push and pull with God throughout his ministry. Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? That's something that we may ask ourselves sometimes when we hear God calling to us. Who am I? to do such an amazing thing as deliver the people of God, to deliver those who are oppressed? I think these are great questions, but I think it's kind of connected to what God's answer is here. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God says, I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you've brought them out of Egypt, you'll worship on this mountain. Brent Strawn, who's a um, professor at, Emory, at Candler School of Theology at Emory University, says, ultimately, this call isn't about who Moses is. Who am I? Instead of it being about who Moses is, it is about who is with Moses. 
I will be with you, says God. So I think that's our call, our recognition too, that when God calls us, he gifts us, he gives us a passion, and he opens our eyes to the needs of the oppressed in the world. And then he sends us out and says, you go, make a difference in this world. And when we, re when we speak back and say, wait, wait, I, I don't know that I can do this. What we hear from God is, I will be with you. And so I think that's an important part of thinking about this. I will be with you. And this shall be a sign that it is I who sent you. God is with us and God sends us. God doesn't just give us gifts and passions to center ourselves and to live in the status quo. God also sends us to make a difference in the lives of others. So 13 through 15 kind of ends up this text. And so if Moses asks early, who am I to be able to do this? Here the question is a little bit different. I think it, the question is, who are you? God says, I'm with you. And then Moses says to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say to them? So this is the, who are you, God? When people ask, how do I tell them who you are? And and how will they believe that you have sent me? God says to Moses, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. It could be translated. God says further, thus you shall say to them, it is I am who has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. I am. So it's a return again to the remembrance of the God who has been with God's people since the beginning, the God of our ancestors, the God who has saved us when we couldn't save ourselves and delivered us from oppression throughout it all. It's a God that has been with us from the beginning, is with us now, and will be with us through eternity. Now, we are certainly free, as Moses was, to say no, to respond to God's call on our life and say, you know, things are going pretty well right now. I know for me, I struggle with, with my privilege. It's easy for me as a middle-class white male who has a wife and three kids who works in a church and is a Christian, all of the things about me are privileged in our society. I'm educated. But that's not what God is calling me to be, just to sit and relax in the things that go well. I think what God is calling me to do is to use my voice, to yield my privilege, and to lift up the voices of those who are oppressed in our society so that we can listen to them not try to correct them, not try to fix them, but to listen to them, to ask them what they need, to, instead of centering myself, to center the needs of those who are oppressed. I don't know, but if you're like me, and I read this story of Exodus, it is easier for me to maybe think of myself as Moses, the one who can, God is called to go make a difference in the world. Sometimes it can be easy for me to think of myself as those who find themselves enslaved. Maybe I'm the people of God. But that's not my reality right now. I think a harder thing for me to do is to recognize myself as the Egyptians in this story. They're the ones who maybe their life is going okay. And they have these people on the side who are doing all the dirty work and the hard work for them. And they're a little bit afraid of them when they call out and, and want their own freedom. They want freedom from oppression. 
they aren't granted that. Later, when Moses goes to the Pharaoh and says, free them, they say, oh, maybe, but then what's going to happen? We need them to do our dirty work. But we'll get rid of them whenever we don't need them. I think we have to figure out, I have to figure out, in the society in which I live, who are those people who are on the margins? And because of my lack of, because of my silence, or because of my unwillingness to yield my privilege and let the voices of others rise up, am I actually being the one who is the oppressor? So am I, so who am I in this story is a good question for me. Maybe I'm Moses being called by God to help be a deliverer of the people who are under oppression. And I can only do that by listening to their voices crying out, just as God does, to recognize their suffering, to know them intimately, and then to lift up their voices to help them recognize that their freedom is rooted in God's, reconcili God's reconciling love. That God is a God who seeks justice and equity, who loves and offers grace to those in need, and who hears those who are crying out. There's a powerful tradition in Israelite culture of lament. When we read the Psalms, we see this a lot. How long, O oh Lord, will you let this go on? My enemies are oppressing me. They're, they're coming from all sides of me. How long will you let this go on? Let me live and protect me so I can speak of your goodness in the world. The Bible tended to be written throughout all of it from positions of marginalization in an effort to remember the God who is with them always, who has delivered them in the past and will deliver them in the future. And too often we read it from a place of privilege, thinking about, all right, what are the rules that people need to follow? How do we lift the, up this rule to say, oh, I'm doing the right thing and everyone else is a little bit below me. And if everybody would just do the things that I do, then they would live the life that I'm living. But power can be deceptive. And Jesus turns everything up on its side. The first shall be last. The last shall be first. I have come to release the captives. I am eating with tax collectors and sinners, which makes everybody upset. <laughs> I'm not going to repay violence for violence. But I'm going to pray for my enemies and offer forgiveness for everyone regardless of if they know they've offended or not. So my hope for you, my challenge for you, is to listen to God's calling in your life and to listen to the needs of the world. Do the research. I know we're not all researchers, but um, don't just read the things that you read all the time. Don't compare. One's tragedy does not diminish another's tragedy. And when we read the Bible and we read the newspaper or watch online, as most of us do now probably, then how do we move the love and grace, the gifts of the Spirit that can flow through us? How do they speak to us to make a difference in this world that is hurting? How do we give hope to people who, are, who feel hopeless? How do we yield our power? So that it's not about how much we have. It's not about how safe we feel. It's not about any of those things. It's about how do we love our neighbor as ourselves. And Jesus called that neighbor a Samaritan. <laughs> One of the most hated people of the time. So if we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves, our neighbors are not just those who are like us. Our neighbors are those that we may even see as our enemies. And Jesus calls us to love our enemies as ourselves. So I think there's a clash with our culture. I think our culture tells us to be independent, 
to center ourselves on the things that make a difference in us. But when we hear the story of Moses, we know that Moses comes down from this place soaked in grace, recognizing he's never alone, recognizing that God has a call for his life that, that he can't do by himself. It has to be God working within him. He can't control it. We like to control lots of things. But if we're truly living a life of faith, it involves trust in the God who calls us, who sends us, and who is with us no matter what. So blessings to you all today. May you be absorbed in this grace. May you hear God's voice calling out to you and make you make a difference in the world. Speaking out for God. May God bless you and keep you. May God's grace surround you. May the face of God illuminate among you so that you may experience the truth and love of God and share that with everyone you meet. And as you return, may the wonders that God has shown you inform how you treat the world. Love God, love the person in front of you, love the stranger, love the enemy. It's all about love. So may you be blessed. Go in peace and may God be with you always.